Josephine Wood. I'm the Senior Programme Officer of the Joint Undertaking. And this is our session on international cooperation. The way we're going to do this is I'm going to say a few words and then I'm going to ask my esteemed colleagues to come and say a few words as well. The first thing I need to say is unfortunately uh, Olivier Bringer was not able to come from Brussels today. Um, so he sends his apologies. Um, so I'm going to just say a few words, a little bit about what we're doing at the JU, just to set the scene a little bit. And then I'm going to pass the floor to the colleagues. So firstly, what I can say about this, this topic is it's clearly a hot topic. We were just in the last session where people asked questions about which countries were eligible and not eligible to work with a joint undertaking. Uh, but it's not a new topic. Um, I think international cooperation in HPC ecosystem has been something that's been happening for a long time now. And it's clearly, uh, it's clearly a question that we in the joint undertaking uh, need to start thinking about. As you probably heard my boss Anders say earlier, international cooperation is something that was introduced in the new regulation that was adopted uh, this summer. Uh, before that, the joint undertaking simply had to look after uh, infrastructure in Europe, which is big enough, enough as a task already, uh, but we were added this extra responsibility of international cooperation. I have already been asked by some of you, well, what are you doing? And the answer is nothing yet. And this is why this is the first, this conversation is, is to kind of kick off that conversation about what do you think we should be doing at the JU? Um, as you all know, and we've heard a couple of times already this morning, Supercomputing is one of the key priorities for the European Union. Uh, it is working in critical areas of modern society and will play an and has played an instrumental role, for example, in developing solutions for COVID-19, which we we're just talking about. And those collaborations didn't just happen in Europe; they were global collaborations with United States, Japan, and other parts of the world. We in Europe have big aspirations in supercomputing processes and semiconductors, and this is underpinned by the need for collaboration within the European Union um, and within our member states here in Europe. Um, but we also need, and we also need to consider the European ambitions in terms of digital sovereign Europe and the need to include, however, and also the need to include and collaborate with the like-minded across the world. As uh, Dr. Herbert Seisel said cl very clearly today, and he's the chair of my governing board, so anything he says, I listen to very carefully. Europe needs to be resilient and stay open to the world. So now we, we've just had the COVID-19 crisis, although it seems to be continuing. We now have the war in Ukraine. These, these crises further highlight the need uh, for HPC, but also for collaboration and working together. Today, we have in this workshop two speakers who have worked a long time in their particular fields at the international level. And we've asked them to give some insight about the different types of collaborative activities that have been undertaken so far in HPC in the EU. Um, this is a starting point so that then the JU, we can assess and think about what has already been done because there's no point in reinventing the wheel, right? And see what else we can do uh, to build up um, a sustainable international activities which is good for Europe and good for the world. Um, without further ado, because I think I've, I've said enough and I think I've set the scene, I'm going to pass the floor to the first speaker. And before I do that, I just want to say that what I'm going to do is invite both speakers to speak first, and then we, we reserve questions for afterwards. And I'm going to try and ask both speakers, I'm going to be really generous. Last time they only got, last, speak, last workshop they only got 10 minutes. I'm going to ask them, so you've got about 15 minutes each, okay? Don't forget, gentlemen, you are what is between, you are the people between that and our beers at six o'clock, okay? I hope you got the hint. Um, so with further ado, um, I'd like, I'm very pleased that Dr. Are you Dr. Bastian Collar is with us, and he's going to tell us a, a little bit about what's 
um, the computing center in Stuttgart has been doing in this, in this area. So over to you, Christian. Thank you. So thank you. Um, I'll ask to some people coming, that's good. Um, the good thing is, if I look at the audience here, it's a bit like similar than the last two years. I just see most people until here, so it gives me a feeling that I'm back in home office somehow. Uh, but I also appreciate that you're real people, three-dimensional people is perfect. So, about international collaboration, and thank you for giving me the possibility to say some words here. Um, the good thing is, six o'clock, somewhere where we collaborate, it's, uh, it's already later, so it's already beer time there. So this is the, the perfect example for collaboration. Um, can, do I have to press the slides or will they automatically? Yeah. With this one? Yeah. Let's see if this works. Nope. Okay. Mm. Green. Green. Yeah. 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 Ah, here we are. Perfect. So, yeah, I think I reached this level of incompetence that's only for collaboration and no more technical stuff here. Um, good. So, um, I have only two slides to show here, and usually I like to, to shock people by having something like a slide two of 58 or something, 10 minutes talk, which is perfect. No, it's two slides, and I will tell you a bit about what, what you see here. So these are the points um, of our collaborations that we have as the High Performance Computing Center in Stuttgart. You see European collaborations, which are the obvious ones that say also in the frame of EuroHPC and the European HPC strategy. The French Center, Spanish Center, BSC, Gineca, uh, CEA, Jean C, whatever. But we are also, let's say, uh, spreading out to the world. So we have small collaboration with Brazil. We have obviously some collaborations with the US centers. And if you see, also we focus on the Asian area. So what you also see here are, let's say, the red marked parts. These are currently the Russian collaborations which we had, which we had to put on ice now for now. Uh, because of the political issues. They are not cancelled, but we are, have put them on hold to see what will happen here. And the green one is something I will come to later. Let me first tell you what collaboration means for us. Um, if you look, for instance, for the Asian Pacific area, we have close collaborations to Japan. In Japan, we, we have now, I think, more than it's like more 15, 20 years nearly, of collaboration with um, the Tohoku University in Sendai, and uh, NEC there as a technology provider. And this is currently manifested that we, every half year, we have a workshop, two days at least, one usually, if there's no pandemic, yeah, uh, in Japan and one in, in, in Germany, which started with an exchange of these three partners and now went in the direction that when we are in Japan, we have much more of the Japanese colleagues around there, so other collaborators from Japan. And the other way around, um, if it's in, in, in Stuttgart, Germany, we have, uh, let's say, a, a massive amount of the German experts from these fields, other centers, etc. cetera. Um, we work to exchange on, so the, the workshop was called on sustained simulation performance. It's really a technical workshop with some also, let's say, strategic political um, parts. We do afterwards then a book, a book publication in the Springer series. So there's something where we manifest a bit. And ob obviously, we also uh, work, work quite closely together when it's about our technology. Um, so the Tohoku University has usually a similar setup in terms of NEC machines, which we had, or let's say NEC hardware, which we had. So we also exchange here the people, the knowledge, and, and, and transfer technology. Um, another thing, collaboration we do, and this is something which is not only focused on one part, is um, that we were working with a lot of colleagues there on the industrial uh, supercomputing workshop since a while. The interesting thing was that it was about to be restarted with a bit, little bit of a new concept in 2020. And our friend Corona killed us <laughs> in restarting this, so we hope we can do this. And the idea here was really to bring those centers together worldwide which work with industry to exchange best practices, ideas, to exchange, let's say, the common challenges and to, to work on this. So this is also collaboration because, again, we see, obviously, well, as I, I, I tend to say this often, uh, obviously we are the best and we know everything. But sometimes you can even listen to others how they are doing things and then it helps you really to understand this. So collaboration is not something where you tick a box and I remember that when I 
20 years ago, 18 years ago, started in EC projects, there was always a collaboration task. And you had to tick a box and then you had collaborated and you met somebody, but it's, it's, it's far beyond. So these things are done outside of any funding agreements or something like this. This is really where we exchange the people. We have people which sometimes go to Taiwan and, and work with those people. We exchange our software for visualization with the Taiwan Center and they give it back to us. We have an exchange with, let's say, colleagues coming to us and then even get employed at HLS or the other way around. So this is how, what it is about. So this was in a nutshell. Um, this is just something, again, as the usual highlight. We just renewed our agreement uh, with the Ukrainian university. Um, it's the University of Donetsk, where you have to be careful because before I get blamed, this is the part of the university which is now in Prokhorov, and they have, let's say, they had to split the university in two parts here. And we have a massive now support activity to support these Ukrainian colleagues, which also partially come now to HLS to work from there. But this is also something where, from the collaboration, we went into some friendship modes with these people, and that's why we had to renew this collaboration agreement as some official statement. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very clear a uh, very clear introduction into what you guys are doing in Stuttgart. Fabrizio, Dr. Fabrizio Eado. Would you I'm like not to? A medical doctor. No, but you're not a medical doctor. Please, over to you. Okay, since I'm asked to produce some slides, I will uh, show some slides. And uh, I would like to go back to maybe try to address what, in my point of view, are the compelling reasons for international cooperation. So the root, really, uh, of, the, of the entire, um, you know, uh, international collaboration. So as I say in these first slides, as the French would say, uh, uh, tout petit dans, dans la marmite. So I start my uh, professional life, scientific life, in international organization, the European Center for Particle Physics. And if you like, that for me is a good example of the fundamental reason for international cooperation in science. And why is that? Why CERN exists? Well, for many reasons, certainly, and to do good physics. But to do good physics, you need very expensive instruments. Say, you know, in the, you know, just to run CERN at the ordinary budgets, well, I have left CERN uh, quite a few years ago, but I mean, when I left was in the order of one billion euro, per year, well, one billion Swiss franc euro now, they're more or less the same. So it's a huge investment for fundamental research that not a single country, not even a region, can afford it. So the first fundamental reason for having international cooperation in particle physics was the cost of the science. And in fact, CERN is officially European, but United States, India, China, Russia, you name it. The entire universe of physics, or particle physics, gather at CERN, and they all contribute, either uh, with the budget, you know, for the, the 26 member states, or in kind. So, uh, and that, if you like, is, 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 you know, not really related to computing. But the very much same problem apply when CERN needs to deploy an infrastructure to do the computing. And that again was a worthwhile exercise. I was happy and honored to, uh, to be part of that effort to design a system that could only be uh, you know, a worldwide basis. So that was what eventually became the Large Hadron Collider grid. We used to call it grid, now we would call it the cloud. And basically more than 100 institutes from all over the world contributed. So, that is an example which is not specifically related to computing, but is general. So science, particularly big science, require big investment and therefore require association of many, many countries. So it can, all, it can only be international. In parallel, there's also been in whatever, let's say in the next 20 years, an evolution of this scientific paradigm. You know, back many years ago, uh, theoreticians, they were just developing theory, then implemented the theory on a computer, producing some artificial results with the computers, 
then going out, do an experiment, comparing the result, and either approve or disprove the theory. That was traditional science you know, in the last few centuries, more or less. In the last 20 years, big data have come. We have been able to produce huge amount of data because of the normal technology evolution. Now you have sensors that produce billions of channels of information. You can underly, thanks also to the development of uh, fantastic uh, high bandwidth network and so forth. And we could now start to afford to design high-performance computer systems, which are also capable to feed those HPC systems with huge amount of data. And the, the, the scientific paradigm has shifted from theory to just massively produce data, processing data, and you know, defining what is today called data-intensive science, uh, applying machine learning, training huge neural networks, and therefore extracting the science in a more, let's say, empirical way from the data. And then again, require huge amount of investment and huge amount of data. And the data cannot just come from one country or one lab in whatever discipline. I mentioned physics before, but if you go to life science, earth science, you know, modeling the future of, of, of climate and everything else, it can only be done internationally. It's not just an option. So we don't do international cooperation because we are nice guy and we like to, to work with everybody else. It's either that or there is no science. So that, if you like, for me, are the, the compelling reason for international cooperation. And I think you know, they are coming out from all the discussion we heard so far. Uh, since I'm asked to give uh, some practical example, I spend most of my time nowadays, uh, since I retired from Microsoft, uh, working at the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. And there, there is you know, plenty of collaboration, a little bit along the line that you know, uh, my colleague and friend from HLRS has said. And, and there again, uh, one of the, one of the uh, you know, uh, reason, uh, or let's say one of the theme at the Barcelona Supercomputer Center, very much driven by by Matteo Valero, you know, our, our director, has been to all the time look for uh, technology that could make uh, high-performance computing better and easier. And again, I mean, a few years ago, you know, after uh, investing for many years uh, on ARM technology, which is not open source, but at least is not proprietary of any vendors, uh, we come up with the, the idea of moving aggressively on RISC-V, which again, has not been invented at BSC, has not been invented in Europe, has actually been invented by two very good uh, uh, friends of us, who, by the way, they are Turing laureates, you know, uh, 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 and, uh, you know, uh, David Patterson uh, from Stanford, uh, sorry, from Berkeley, and John Hennessy from, from Stanford. And they created this risc five. ISA, you know, instruction set architecture, which is open, anyone can take it, and we decide to invest in that. And again, that is an in interesting piece of international cooperation. Uh, invented in, Euro in the States, moved to Europe. Now the, uh, there is a foundation established in Zurich, in Switzerland, and there is a risc development center in India, you know, a company called uh, uh, C5, which I believe has been recently acquired by Intel. So, you know, we, we Everything we do, it can only be done on an international base. So those are two practical examples. Uh, they are really a tangible evidence uh, of the need, the compelling need for international cooperation if we want to advance in science. Regardless from any other, you know, of course, science unite the world. I still remember, you know, my early days at CERN when the same experiment run by a Chinese board, Nobel Prize, Samuel Ting, uh, American, you know, born in uh, Hong Kong, and his own experiment in the 70s, you know, in the middle of the Cold War, in the same experiment, it was Pakistan, India, China, Taiwan, the, the, you know, the Soviet Union, United States, all of Europeans, and they were all working peacefully against the target of discovering new particles, etc. So with that, basically, I would like to, uh, you know, conclude and looking forward to uh, you know, an exciting dialogue conversation with all your guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. Now, I just have a question. I'm looking for someone in the audience.
is, by any chance, Dr. Ishoka in the audience somewhere? Yes, he's there. So, Dr. Ishoka um, is in charge of is, is in charge of the Brussels office of the Ricken Institute in Japan, and I I set this up with him a couple of days ago because I thought it'd be interesting to get uh, your perspective on international collaboration. So I have a very simple question for you, um, which is, what does coming from where you come from and the Ricken Institute? Why would you want, why do you, do you think international collaboration is important? And why does a country like Japan want to collaborate with Europe? Um, I hope that's okay as a question. I'd be really grateful if you could give us a little bit of an insight from your perspective on this discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for, for the question and thank you very much for giving me a chance to speak. So I'm representing Riken. Maybe Riken, the name of Riken is known better with the host institute for Fugaku Supercomputer. And Riken is a comprehensive and holistic Japanese national institute. Uh, it's a bit like smaller scale CNRS in France or Max Planck Society in Germany. So we, can, we are tackling whatever topics we want, except for military or you know, ethically you know, difficult subject. And, uh, you know, in Japan, there is no equivalent, which means that if we want to compare ourselves with someone else, naturally it will be international comparison. And even though we have, an, uh, we have Fugaku Supercomputer and uh, a dedicated center for computer science and also an, another center for quantum computing, uh, we don't think that we can do everything together, uh, sorry, everything alone. And we'd rather, you know, succeed together than falling alone. So I think that's our kind of spirit. And also, we all I think we all agree that uh, diversity is a source of innovation, and science has no border. So as Fabrizio said, of being myself as physicist by education, I totally agree that it can only be international. Well, actually, in my previous capacity, my role was to, inter to develop an international strategy for, for a Japanese funding agency. And uh, the, the base of my strategy was that uh, when our international strategy has been successfully implemented, there will be no more international you know, in the conversation. International must be something just natural and uh, by default. So, uh, well, you know, uh, I think in terms of the, the, the better science and also the healthy competition, uh, international cooperation is a must for us. Uh, uh, okay, and uh, let me also comment that in terms of the EU-Japan or Europe-Japan cooperation, there has been already a number of overarching high-level agreements. We have science and technology cooperation agreement. We have economic partnership agreement strategic partnership agreement, connectivity agreement, and we now talk about digital partnership. So uh, I think it's now time to, to implement real down-to-the-earth actions. Uh, did I answer to your question? Um, not yet. Hold your horses. Hold your horses. Okay. So thank you. And I'm glad you actually, talked to, you actually mentioned the word concrete because one of the questions that we're asking ourselves in the GNU is concretely, what does international collaboration look like? So my first question to you, panelists, and to the audience if you want to comment or question is, should future collaborations be bottom up or top down? So that's the question I have for that. Who would like to answer that question first? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that uh, the answer is very easy. You need both. Uh, you need both, and if, a, you know, if we like to take a practical example, if we take the United States, who are, of course, investing a lot in research, you have um, the Exascale program is driven by the Exascale Computing Project, which is entirely bottom-up. It's basically a relatively large amount of funding going from the federal government to one uh, department, the Department of Energy, 
and with their six laboratory, they are basically developing the SSK project. And you know, it's a typical well done, well executed, uh, uh, top down approach. But then you have the National Science Foundation. The National Science Foundation found thousands of projects which rely on the high performance compute infrastructure that the Department of Energy is setting up and doing software libraries, uh, computational science, so forth. And that instead is purely competitive. There are calls, there are dear colleagues' letters sent to, to the top scientists, and then is a, is a complete uh, bottom-up approach. So I think you need both, because when you go around, you know, you're HPC. I mean, you are funding a huge system that require a huge amount of money. So there you need the government uh, take up. You need, uh, you know, you can only go top down. There is no way that a bunch of us, a bunch of scientists can come up with one billion, you know, to, to support uh, a, an SSK computer. But at the same time, you know, Horizon Europe, you know, it's very simple. Horizon Europe is developing, uh, is promoting a lot of bottom-up collaboration, and you need both. You need absolutely both. Thank you. Bastian, do you want to comment? <coughs> More or less, I completely agree with what uh, Fabrizio was saying. The, I think it needs a mixture of both, but also the frame for both. So ideally, if you look at collaborations, how they sometimes happen, it's not like that we look in the World Wide Web and look who wants to collaborate and then we do something concrete. So you need to get into contact with the people. And I think this could be triggered, let's say, by some framework of exchange fora which then also foresees, let's say, if you talk about funding or not, now obviously everybody wants to have funding, mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you do something like a cascade funding of really then concrete ideas. So having the frame set up for people to exchange, to fight com find commonalities, as we do currently on a national level or on a European level, but then also if they are concrete enough, an important part is concrete. Not just we want to collaborate, give us the money, but we have a certain point then really to, to use this for, for, for um, yeah, support. Absolutely, okay. Any comments or that or questions from the audience? Very shy, no? Sure, okay. So I have another question, um, which is more about the level of innovation and the focus of a future collaboration. So as I said, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, but um, we equally want to, uh, sorry, I've just lost my page, but we equally want to, we want to try and come up with new strategy, well, new strategies. We want to make sure that the strategies we develop for UHPC in its work program are complementary. Uh, the international collaboration should be complementary to our, our strategies. So my question is, should we be going for sort of TRL one, two, three, or more, bearing in mind that as you saw from the presentations earlier, we have very much the RNI calls, which are TRL 1, 2, 3, and then we have the deployment activities, which are obviously high up in the innovation chain, value chain. Do you have views on this? No, you can go on. Well, again, in, in supporting, you know, a, an exascale plan, Euros PC program, uh, clearly, you have the two sides. You have the research side, you know, I mentioned, for instance, RIS-5. I'm pleased that RIS-5 is, is now even explicitly mentioned in the, in the, micro, in the CHIP Act, and that is research. Uh, honestly, I'm a big promoter of RIS-5 because I'm a big promoter of open source in, in any field, including high performance computing. But it will take years to reach, I mean, ARM, it's just about to reach the maturity of the classical, you know, Intel-based uh, architecture. And RIS-5, it will require quite a few years to become really viable. I, in parallel, you have to support the scientific community. And, and you need to do, again, both. You need to invest in the research so that in five years, Europe will be able to have their own, uh, you know, source of high performance computing source in Europe, maybe with the collaboration of the good guys, you know, the people who like to come to Europe and do international cooperation. All of us have seen this flamboyant announcement of Intel, 80 billions to be invested in Germany, France, and other countries. So people who come seriously for collaborating in Europe should be welcome. 
uh, especially if they come from, uh, from, uh, from a region like the United States, which is a traditional lies of, of Europe, at, at least in science. But at the same time, you need uh, to invest, you know, so you need to do both. You need to serve the community for which you need off the shelf available computers using the best technology you can buy, and at the same time invest for the next generation of computers. I mean, uh, uh, it's good that you, you, uh, you solicit some comment from Riken. Riken uh, and you know, uh, our good friend Satoshi Matsuoka has in a way pioneered a way of designing the system rather than just buy. He could have just run a tender and the best tender he got it, no. He decided to cooperate, to co-design the Fugaco together with one of their major industrial partners, Fujitsu. And they did it together. I still remember <laughs> having lunch with, with Satoshi at, at, the, at the Tokyo fish market not long ago, and I didn't believe that he could in three years switch to a new architecture to ARM and develop a machine that turned out to be number one in the world. So that is something that we should now think about in Europe and for the next generation of machine, build, ride and buy. And, and you know, I'm a strong believer of that. But at the same time, you need to procure machines. So you know, you need both. Sorry, my colleague doesn't know I'm speaking in a conference, in a panel. <laughs> it happens. Okay, thank you. So that's the infrastructure and definitely, co well, co-design is an interesting point which I might come back to in a second. What do you think? I mean, are you more on the infrastructure or the applications side? Because I'm looking for concrete here. Yeah, it's yeah. a good point. Let's, yeah. let's say it that way. Um, the infrastructure is currently something which is important for my, my beloved word sovereignty. Yes. Um, the only thing is, it, uh, from my viewpoint, there's always a big danger. Um, if we focus too much on the one, we would lose, let's say, the balance on the other side. So right. if you look, so from my humble perspective, I think in infrastructure, or let's say techno infrastructure technology part, we are a bit not, not perfect yet. In the applications part, we are very strong. Yeah. And the importance is that we keep the strength in the applications without, let's say, um, without, let's say, unbalance is always bad. But we should take into account that things in the applications area which are ongoing and we have the European activities but also these have a widespread to international collaboration with that. Um, and we have to ensure that we get the best possible knowledge even from outside in a somewhat protected frame there to really enhance this. In the applications field, which at the same time setting up the infrastructures um, as optimal as possible. And because because that's that's all that's all very well. I'm going to challenge a little bit, but that's what shouldn't we be doing that as Europeans already? Why? Why I'm challenging. I'm not. Should, why? Why open up the, open ourselves up to the whole world when we're actually, as a as a European Union, as member states, trying to already work together? And that's hard enough as it is. Obviously, everything is hard. <laughs> uh, being bluntly honest, at the end, it it rather depends, from my viewpoint, on the frame. You have to establish trust somehow if you work together. And trust can be established, let's say, by legal parameters yeah. in a certain absurd way. Um, or you do this, let's say, because the people know each other for a long time and really trust each other. At the end, there's a business behind that. Yeah. That has to be clear to everyone. But I think our, we have to find a way where we can open ourselves, but at the same time, obviously, protect our things. But this is the whole problem. It's, it's not black or white. Yeah. It's something in between. And, and we have to, again, it's a frame, from my viewpoint, what matters, because you see that individuals and the BSC, HLS are just two examples of many. They are doing collaboration. And they're not thinking about, let's say, oh, uh, I should not collaborate further than this borderline or something like this. We're doing this because we find people with a common interest. Then you have the political aspects, which is completely fine. And this has to be taken into account properly. But again, there is a possibility for both from my side. But I'm just a... No, no, very helpful, very yeah. helpful. Yeah, if I could add that is uh, an important role and mission for the European Commission and, of course, the general undertaking is also to define a policy that can allow Europeans, European manufacturers, there are not that many in a performance computing, so we're still highly dependent on US, Japan, China, you name it. So we need a policy by which we can work with these people with clear conditions 
So we are not just uh, going to remain a market, which is the only market open to anyone, because we need to secure our source of strategic resources. That includes fabrication. I mean, in the morning, we, we heard, I think it was Herbert Heisel mentioning the importance of having fabrication. If we don't have the entire chain, and it's going to take a lot of effort, and we are not, it is, I think it's not realistic to imagine that in Europe we'll be able to do it completely on our own. So we need to define a framework by which you know, our Japanese colleagues, our Taiwanese colleagues, the Americans, everyone, can work with us and help us to fill the gap. Now, it's not necessarily in their interest, because you know now, America is a closed market, Japan is a closed market, China is a closed market, they're all closed market except one, Europe. So they all come here and they make business, they make money. Until the policy is, you come, you're welcome, but the IP you produce will remain in your, you know, all this kind of the European added value. I think you, know, you should really to carry on and carry over the other value you, you, that you have introduced in your mission, and then for me is a fundamental point. But for that, you know, we need the policy makers. We need the policy. Of course, yes, If yes. I can add oh, something. Is, oh, sorry. Oh, ah, sorry. Actually, oh. yes. Uh, I have uh, yeah, one, uh, enfin, two questions. First, yeah. uh, think about uh, the Airbus example. <laughs> Many things, uh, and, and so, what is your view on uh, the, the need to integrate uh, industrials in this ecosystem? Because you spoke about the manufacturers, but we have, we are convinced that you have to take into account too the, the industrial, which are the users of uh, of this HPC. And the second question is uh, the link with the other uh, European digital strategy uh, tasks, which are launched. Uh, we are speaking of cloud and so on. There is initiative uh, in uh, European digital strategy on cloud and security. Is there any link or, or nothing for the moment? Okay, so who would like to take the first question and I'll try and handle the second one, unless you want to talk about European cloud strategy. Well, so, so first one was about the integration of industry. Yeah. You said, I think everybody should be integrated. If they provide you the, the things that you need to know, let's say, let's say, if they have a requirement, if they're acting as an end user, they should be integrated in the, let's say, finding out what they will need and, and, and then you work together with the people on how to achieve this. The other thing is if they are providers of technologies, obviously they should also be integrated. And this is good because it was one comment I wanted to make. I think the important part is that we look at things which are already working. And if I look, for instance, there are, let's say, in our environment in, in, in Germany, we have solution centers. We have there OEMs, so like an automotive sim simulation center. We have an OEMs there, we have universities there, we have ISVs there, we have um, the, the, the technology provider there, and they work together on common aspects. So it's hard to imagine that, let's say, car manufacturer, Opel works together with Daimler, works together with Porsche on the same thing, but they can do this up to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something where we should learn what is the frame in which they are doing these pre-competitive things, so which could be a, a blueprint for us working together with, with, let's say, more or less the whole world, and simply saying, how do they protect their own knowledge, IP, and still we can, can utilize the synergies of the knowledge, not only, let's say, of our closed environment here, but also, let's say, from, from, from everywhere. And I think this is what I meant with black and white. It's possible. And the important part is really, again, these things should be done with a clear strategy, what we need at the end to come out. And this is, again, by taking into account the opinions of all the involved stakeholders, end users, technology providers, scientists, whoever you count in there. I think this is the important part here. Yeah, if I, if I can add, uh, following what Bastian said, well, first of all, HLRS is a wonderful uh, uh, example of collaboration with industry, in particular with the automotive industry and all the things they have been doing with Porsche and, and, and their manufacturer. And that is one side. The other side is industry as a provider of high performance computing. Here we have a number of problems. Number one, we should not fool ourselves, the HPC market is a niche market. Uh, you know, Intel in the state produce processor for any, you know, for the large spectrum of applications. The HPC market is not a market that can be self-sustained. So it's either strategic, 
So you put a lot of money to build an SS scan machine because it's strategic, because it's going to give industry the competitive edge to come out with a better airplane or with a better drugs or whatever. Or you need HPC for homeland security. You know, we see them now, you know, even uh, in the unfortunate situation they were all living to the, today, the importance of the cyber war. So if you don't have at least the same HPC power, then your potential enemy, you are going to be in a very, very difficult situation. We should not close our eyes that China and United States, just to take two, they have a tremendous advantage when it goes to high performance computing, that there is no segregation between defense research and civil research. Maybe you have something like that with COA in France, where you have a military branch and a you know, defense branch, not military defense branch, and a civil branch. But out, outside France, you know, CERN, I mentioned at the beginning, CERN by, by definition cannot engage in any potential development that could be even remotely used for defense military purpose. So that is something that may be in the current situation. I hear the, uh, you know, the um, various senior authorities in, in the European Commission saying that maybe we need to invest more in the, in the, in the European defense plan. I'm fully behind that. And here, the, and removing this segregation, it was something that I think was aired, I don't know if it's happening, with the launch of Horizon Europe different from what we had before. Remember that the same segregation that CERN had, it was all across all the European research program. You cannot do military research. That goes to other budget, to other thing, etc. That is something that our politicians should reflect because we are giving the Americans and the Chinese a tremendous competitive advantage because they can spend as much as they like through the military program to define the best possible supercomputer that then can also be sold and used in civil research. I mean, DARPA is military research, but DARPA has done everything. They have invented the internet. Internet comes out from military research, we like it or not. So, so on the cloud question, um, there are similar debates in the cloud community as there are in the HPC about strategic autonomy. You've heard of probably about the initiatives around Gaia X and setting up a European cloud. It's exactly the same question, which is how do we, at what point, when do we, how long do we stay open? And then at what point do we have to close the shop, if I can use that analogy, uh, to do so? And, and uh, yeah, it's a very similar situation. I think you'll find also that with the latest crisis in Ukraine, sadly, that, that, uh, that, 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 that will develop even more into protecting Europe and, and strengthening, sorry, strengthening Europe's res resilience in these technologies than, than, than opening, it, opening it up. But even in that situation, the question is how do we, how do we maintain with like-minded, and, I, and I, I, hate, I hate that term, but I think it's become even more important to stress that term, like-minded countries, um, how we, we can continue to collaborate, because if there's one thing that everybody agrees is against a common enemy, one has to collaborate. So. I think, um, uh, yeah, so, so I think that kind of hopefully answers your questions, but the data, the, the data conversation and the infrastructure conversation are basically moving in very much in parallel. Now, I'm going to open the floor to one last question because the good news is if we do really well, we can leave, finish half an hour early and go for beer. Um, any more questions? Any more thoughts? Um, uh, yes, there's a hand up there. Was that just someone scratching his head? No, someone's scratching his head. <laughs> um, any other questions? Okay, so the take-home messages I'm hearing for the JU is, yes, we need to collaborate at an inter with, with our partners in internationally, uh, but not just on anything. We need to think carefully, carefully what we do and what would add value and is concrete. Uh, yes, we need to also think about the role of industry um, and we need to work out at what level of innovation we should be uh, collaborating. Co-design works, I think, at the very basic research level, but may become more complicated at the more at the, at the area of deployment of machines and applications and software. Um, and I'm also hearing that JU, at the very least, could at least organise um, opportunities for different 
stakeholders in our community to meet up with stake like-minded stakeholders in the global community, uh, at least to, to continue the conversations and allow for contacts to be built and developed. That's my first take home. That's all I'm going to take home as homework for me today. If you've got any other thoughts of what we could be doing concrete, and I mean concrete, um, uh, you know how to get hold of me. Um, my email is on the Trace website. So on that note, or you could also contact these two gentlemen who, can, who know how to get hold of me. So on that note, firstly, once again, I want to thank Prace for the opportunity to organize this workshop. They've done an incredible job. So for the Prace colleagues in the audience, thank you, thank you. To my two co-speakers, thank you so much for joining this discussion. And last but not least, to you, the audience, for hopefully finding this useful um, and a bit of a new start in terms of what we do. But as I said, I don't want, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to think about where we could, what direction we can go in in these slightly complicated times that we live in. On that note, thank you very much, and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you.